Hello and good to have you here. Have you ever wondered about that fake news? Is it incredible you watch a political event, you look at one news source, and you look at another one, and you're like, are you guys watching the same thing? They twist, they turn, they pivot, they verbally package. Who's telling the truth? I don't know about that. But there is fake news in most sales training, most sales mindset. We're going to expose that today. I do have the truth to those. Let's talk about it. Maximize your influence. Kurt Mortensen is the author of Persuasion IQ, Laws of Charisma, and the best selling book, Maximum Influence. Awesome to have you here, Kurt Mortensen, Podcast 512. Hope everyone's having an incredible week. It's kind of the week for me, or at least last week was, last couple of weeks of graduations, weddings, warmer weather. In fact, this last Saturday, three weddings to attend, two graduation parties, too much, got to pick and choose, a lot of things going on. Hopefully, you're managing your time. So let's get into it with the persuasion blunder, or let's call it the blinja. Now, those new to maximize your influence, a blinja is a combination blunder ninja. You get to choose what it is. Remember a little housekeeping, everything you need, all the links we talk about on the show, your free persuasion IQ assessment, information on advanced training, Influence University, the free coaching sessions, everything you need is at MaximizeYourInfluence.com. All right, with that out of the way, let's talk about this blinja at the airport this week. And I've seen this before, I've noticed this before, it just kind of hit me harder this time. I was kind of hungry, not really hungry. Not hungry enough to go to a restaurant, so I went to one of those convenience stores at the airport. There's one every couple of blocks, if that's what they call it, at the airport. There were no prices anywhere. There was no place to find a price. You know, some places where you can scan it yourself and find the price. Didn't even have that. If you want to find the price, you had to wait in line, let them scan it, and decide if you wanted it. Wow. I decided, no way. They're not going to take advantage of me. Not going to do it, because you know they're going to ream you. There's some about every airport restaurant, every airport store. Why? Because they can. I think there's collusion. Every restaurant, every store is expensive. Part of it's part of that rent they pay. Part of it is you didn't plan ahead. You didn't buy your aspirin. You didn't buy your food. You could wait to buy the food on the airplane. And that's probably even worse. It's just as expensive. And the food is not even close to being as good. And so I walked. I'm not going to buy it. I don't want to go through this. I'm really not that hungry. My fault for not planning ahead. And it's all about that scarcity. Where else are you going to go to get food? If you're hungry, what are your choices? You're in the airport. You've gone through security. You can go through a restaurant and pay $25 for a burger. You can get less than mediocre food on an airplane. That's why they charge you. That's why stadium food is so expensive. No other option. Theater food. In fact, is it a graduation this week? <laughs> And for those people that didn't buy flowers, they had flowers there. Of course they did. You couldn't run and get them. I'm sure there were flower stores that were pretty close, but they were charging like 40, 50 bucks for a bundle because you had to because they could. And that's all about the law of scarcity. When it's the only thing around and you have to get it, you can charge whatever you want. Would you ever pay $100 for a bottle of water? There was a time in my life I probably would have. I was doing a desert hike with a bunch of boys. You'd run out of water. We would plan to fill up. It didn't work. And at the end of the hike, we would have paid anything, anything for water because we were so thirsty. And that's the key. Get your prospects so thirsty in an ethical way that they'll pay whatever they can to solve their problem because you are the problem solver. So that brings us to our geeky Scarly article. Actually comes from Dan Ariely. Love his stuff. He wrote the predictably irrational. He just talks about human behavior, why we do what we do. And he's a behavioral economist. And he looked at numbers and the persuasiveness of numbers and restaurant menus and what pulled better. Isn't that fascinating? Because menus try everything from the decor to what the waiters and waitresses are wearing to the menus to format. All that stuff matters. We know this. Everything around us matters from temperature that we talked about last week to is the sun out, is the moon out, is it good weather, is it bad weather, all that matters. And so we noticed with these menus, so you know, 
And you might be able to use some of this on your websites or face-to-face or when you're introducing the price or investment of your product that they used decoys. We see this in grocery stores all the time. Basically, you see a bottle of aspirin that's $12 and the one next to it's $5. Hello. No one's going to spend $12. That's a decoy. That's also called a red herring. So they strategically placed these decoy items that were just not worth it, out of control. Really, 20 bucks for Brussels sprouts? <laughs> Something like that. When a higher price dish was added to the menu alongside existing options, the other options looked much better. And part of that, too, sometimes they use what's called anchor pricing. If you're looking at the steaks, the big one, the tomahawk, if you've ever had one of those, is 100 bucks. You're like, what? And then all of a sudden, oh, that one's 50. That one's 30. Oh, that one's 20. They look much better because of the anchor, the big price, the door and the face above it. An interesting thing about the layout, he found out the menus organized in a clear and logical manner with strategic spacing. A lot of times white space is just as important as the actual text that you're using. So they looked at spacing, fonts, visuals, and that could guide the diner's attention to other choices. And that brings up the visuals. We know that fast food restaurants spend a lot of money in that drive through on those pictures because those visuals stimulate appetite. They stimulate buying decisions. That does matter. And then, of course, what I really wanted to get into is that price presentation. How do you present the price? Whether it be on a website, whether it be face-to-face, on a contract, on a proposal. How do you put that number? Do you put the cents? Do you put the dollar sign? Do you round it off? Now, in negotiation, we have found that odd numbers are more persuasive. Or even asking for a raise. Well, I want $10,000. No, why shouldn't we go for $11,431 and make it look like you've done your research and let them know where that number has come from. But on just basic, basic things like a menu, this is what they tried out. Visualize this with me. So the first one they tried out, price of this item was $12. This must have been before inflation. But anyway, it was the dollar sign... 12.00. So imagine that. Dollar sign 12.00, $12. Then they tried the 12, just the number 12. So the first one was the dollar sign 12.00, then just the number 12. Then they tried spelling it out T W E L V E, 12. All right, spell it out. Let's see how that's done. And then they tried dollar sign 12, no decimals. So dollar sign 1, 2. And when it was the longest one, dollar side, one, two, dot, zero, zero, did the worst. When they just did dollar side, one, two, that was more effective than the whole thing, right? Dot, zero, zero, zero. So that was number two. Then as you go up the line, the one that was almost the most effective was spelling it out, 12. That was more persuasive than a lot of the numerical formats, spelling it out. It didn't have the same impact, but the most persuasive was just 12. Nothing in front of it, nothing behind it, no dollar sign, no decimal. That was the most persuasive, the most effective. It wasn't formal, and it seemed to be more appealing to customers. Now, it's going to depend on situation, the amount, the culture, of course. All these things can matter. So certain price formats, such as spelling, minimal punctuation, keeping it simple, good pictures, And this can apply to anything that you are doing. So there's a lot of psychological factors when it comes to this. I continually talk about those subconscious triggers that up to 95% of persuasion and influence involves those subconscious triggers. It's just got to feel right. And you know that with the menu, you got to take order, you're visiting with people, they're going to come in five minutes. What do you order? It could be based on what you're craving. I know a lot of times I've been craving one thing and I've ordered a different thing, just... Maybe it was a special, how it was presented, what was recommended. There's a lot of science of just the food in general, the menu, and just the tips the waiters get. We know that waiters and waitresses touch, they get higher tips. They smile, they get higher tips. When you say, hey, what's your most popular item? They strategically choose some of the most expensive ones. Yeah, they do. When they repeat back your order... That increases tips. And when they say good choice, and you're like inside, yes, it is. 
boost to the esteem that also increases tips. There's a whole science here and we can take that and use that in any aspect of what you're doing with your persuasion, your sales, your influence, whatever you're doing, subconscious triggers matter. So with that, let's get into the content of the day. That fake news. <laughs> In sales and sales training, we've all heard this. I've been in sales a long time, been in influence a long time. And there's certain things that you hear that would be fake news. And with any fake news, there's portions of truth in there. It's just kind of wrapped around. It's not the complete truth. It's kind of twisted or people have taken it the wrong way. But with any news, there's always elements of truth. So let's just go for the first one, especially for new sales reps. What is it they teach them that is fake news? The first one is think positive. Have happy thoughts. So that's good. I'm all about that, but that's impossible. Let's stink and think and don't think that way. You're like, oh, okay, and you feel guilty. I shouldn't think like that. But most of our thoughts are negative. You look at humans, over 90% of the average person, most of their thoughts are negative. Everybody, doesn't matter where you are, who you are, you will have a negative thought. So why are you telling people not to have negative thoughts? Just say, no, don't focus on those negative thoughts. That's the key. Everyone's going to have that negative thought. So an unsuccessful person's going to have that negative thought. And what they do is like, oh, that could happen. They'll probably say no. They will reject me. They won't say yes. They won't buy from me. I'm a failure, I won't make quota, I'm a loser, I'm going to eat dog food the rest of my life, right? That downward spiral is not a good thing. Now, here's the key. A successful person has the same negative thought. That's why it's dangerous to tell people never to have negative thoughts, because they will, they do. That's part of being human. So a successful person has that same negative thought and they just redirect it. So you can't control your thoughts, but you can redirect it. You can decide what you're going to focus on. So instead of focusing, I say like, no, that's not true. They're going to buy. They're going to do it. Some people call that inner voice the devil and Edna, their mean bullying friend. They name it. No. Nice try, Aunt Edna. Not going to work. Not this time. Not going to happen. Whatever works for you is fine. I'm just saying to you, that is fake news. You can't do that. And that's one of the things I address in millionaire psychology. In fact, let's make that the special of the week. I'll put that link under Maximize Your Influence under Podcast 512. So that's the first one. The second one, fake news with anybody in sales persuasion and influence, Get more closing skills. So if you're not getting your quota, you're not doing very well, most people default to, you need closing skills. You've heard me say it before that closing skills is like trying to get a kiss after a bad date. If they don't like you and they don't trust you, a clever phrase is not going to help you out. And the same thing's true in sales. When you get to the close, they should be ready to say yes. There might be a few more questions, a few more objections to the handle, but for the most part, they are ready. The way you open a sale, showing them that you're the expert, that you know what you're talking about, you've proven your worth, you've built the trust, you've done that, you don't need another closing skills. I would back up and look at other things like, okay, are they liking you? Have you built rapport? Is there trust? Is there credibility? Have you demonstrated that you could solve their problem is a lot more important. I mean, closing is easy. That should just be like 1-2% of your presentation. There's a time and place for a close. Hey, you see the power of that? Yeah, okay, let's get started. It should be that simple if you've done everything right. So closing skills do have their time and place. You know, I rip on them every once in a while, mostly because people do the cheesy, lame, old school ones that don't work anymore. But when you do it the right way, it can be powerful. But for the most part, the way you open them up, the way you do your presentations can be a lot more important to learn and master than a couple more closing skills in your toolbox. The studies I've done are clear that the way you open the sale is much more important than the way you close it. And the research also shows that those hard closes not only offend and push people in the corner, and many times they do get the yes, but they've lost their effectiveness. In fact, when you do that type of close, the refund rates, the returns are off the charts. All right, let's go to our third fake news with sales. Salespeople, sales training, whatever category you're in, objections are good. 
No, not all the time. Now, objections do indicate interest. They do show you have a pivot during your presentation. It does show that they're listening. That's good. I mean, the worst than that would be, do you have any questions? No, they're not listening. They've checked out. They're indifferent. And you've got to walk. But great persuaders pre-solve objections before they happen. Called inoculation. If you want to go to the archives at MaximizeYourInfluence.com, look up inoculation. This is what great persuaders do. They pre-solve objections before they happen. It's interesting. I'm teaching a seminar. I'll throw myself under the bus. This is what I'll do. A company hired me to create objection software. This was for customer service. This was for sales. We identified mostly there's about seven to 10 main ones, but there was about over 70 actually. So I took them all, categorized them, came up with two or three different responses to match the person's personality and put it all just a simple interface where they could click on it and the answer was right there. And then I'll hold up a floppy disk. If you remember those floppy disks, and I said, well, you know, my program was a little nostalgic and they put it on this disk. And then I'll talk about how, if you're not creating trust, you click on this button. If you're not clicking a rapport, you click it on this button. If you hit a brick wall and you're not sure where to go, you click on this button. I talked about some more features and benefits of this persuasion software while holding up this floppy disk. And they're just looking at me like I'm dumber than a stump. And then I stop, I say time out and ask what happened. So persuasion software, I actually did create it, part of Influence University. And they had heard the first part of it, but the moment I held up that floppy disk, their brain hit a brick wall. They didn't hear any more of the features and the benefits about the trust, about the brick wall, about building rapport. They're looking at that disk thinking, Kurt's stupid. Is he stupid? They, I haven't seen one of those in 20 years. I don't have a computer that will run that. He is stupid. I don't, is he kidding? What's going on? What's happening? Their brain hit a brick wall. That's where objections are bad. Getting sure they'd indicate interest, they could be a good thing. But if you're given a presentation and you have an objection and you don't realize it and you keep going, you're motoring through your presentation, their brain's stuck. They haven't heard anything you've said. So your goal is to pre-solve objections. If they're going to bring up you were over budget last time, bring it up first. If they're going to bring it up it's too expensive, you bring it up first. If they're going to bring up something about your competition, you bring it up first. If you were selling, uh, let's say, photocopiers, you're getting ready to talk to the purchasing manager, you're there, you walk in, you see your competition, and your company is top of the line, best of the best, the most expensive. They are the cheapest. And you know when you leave, they're going to say something, so you have to inoculate. That's when you pre-solve the objection. You would say something like, you know what, some call this the most expensive. You know, we are top of the line. That's good verbal packaging. But when you look at our maintenance and toner that we last five years longer, and you do the math, we're actually one of the least expensive. So when they say it, they have the ammunition, the antibodies to refute it. That's what inoculation is. It's a medical term. You get the weak form of the disease to fight off the strong form of the disease. That's why lawyers say, hey, you know what? The opposing counsel is going to call my client mean, ugly, and a bad member of society. You know, and that's true. But that's not why they're on trial today. So if the other side says anything like that, it doesn't have the same sting. So objections can be good, but usually they're not because their brain is hit a brick wall. And most people are just so into their presentation, they don't realize their prospect their customer, their client is not keeping up with them. Final one, they tell you you're working for a great, credible, trustworthy company. And I'm glad you do, and I'm sure you do. But just because that's true does not mean your prospect thinks that. That's fake news to your prospect. True to you, but fake news to them. They've been on the internet, and they're going to find bad things about you and your company on the internet. That's just how it is. It's probably your competition that's post them. You can find anything you want on the internet, good and bad. <laughs> I'm going to go whether that's fair or not because it's just reality. Maybe they had a bad experience with one company in your industry and they're going to blame you for that. They're going to bring it to you. I see that on airlines all the time. Someone had a bad experience on one airline, they're getting mad at another airline and they're going to start mad because of that experience. We see it all the time in network marketing. They had one bad experience here, so then they're all bad. So the piece here is, is you've got to build credibility for yourself and for your company. I'm glad it's a great company. I'm glad they're trustworthy. Just don't assume that they trust you or your company. So there you have it. That's a wrap. That's podcast 512. Like I mentioned before, we're going to do millionaire psychology. That's self-persuasion. That's mindset. 
you want to be successful. We'll just put, say you want to be a millionaire and you can insert any goal in here. If you want to become a millionaire, you start thinking, acting, and doing what other millionaires do. Success is an open book test. This is an audio series. I'll give you over 50% off this audio series. There's an application guide. Go to MaximizeYourInfluence.com, hit Podcast 512, get the special, get the links. Hey, don't listen to that fake news. Now you know the truth. Understand how to become a better influencer, a better negotiator, a better presenter, get more charisma. Learn to motivate yourself and go out and persuade with power. 